All right. Um, hi, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the Law Science Series of Fall 2021. I'm Simon Sun, uh, the co-founder of Law of Science. It is lovely to see you all today. Law of Science is an academic initi initiative founded by Faris al Malki and me. The goal is to create an academic community for those interested in academic research in law around the globe. The Law of Science Initiative supports the diverse methodological perspectives of legal studies and promotes the intellectual exchange of ideas between scholars. Law of Science is a platform for global dialogue on various legal thinking systems in which geographical limitations are eliminated. The initiative does not advance a particular approach. Instead, it seeks to develop a forum for different methodologies of legal studies will evolve. If you're interested in more Law of Science events, please join our email list by clicking the link we have shared in the chat box. Today, we are very fortunate to have Professor Finis Dao Schmidt from Indiana University, Maris Grove Law, to talk about the art of social science modeling and economic analysis of criminal law. Professor Dao Schmidt received both his JD and his PhD in economics from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He is a nationally recognized teacher and scholar in labor and employment law and the economic analysis of legal problems. He is the author of seven books and numerous articles on labor and employment law and the economic analysis of law. And he frequently presents papers at academic conferences and law. And law school across the United States, Canada, Europe, and Asia. He has published with a wide array of publishers and journals, including West Publishing, Cambridge University Press, Duke Law Journal, Michigan Law Review, Texas Law Review, Wisconsin Law Review, Emory Law Journal, and the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies. Professor Dao Schmidt has been invited to teach at various European and Asian universities. In 1990, he received the Scholarly Paper Award from the Association of American Law Schools for his work on the economic analysis of the criminal law as a preference shaping policy. After the lecture, we will have a Q&A session moderated by my partner, Darius Palma. So please prepare your questions for Professor Dao Schmidt. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Dao Schmidt. Well, thank you, Simon. Um, I, I picked uh, this topic. I know uh, my specialty has been primarily labor and employment law, uh, but I picked uh, this this subject of of uh, criminal law because it was a subject that I worked on early in my career when I was kind of learning the tools of modeling and things like this. And I think it's a good example. I I hope of of uh, good modeling. Uh, uh, versus incomplete modeling. And I will try to talk about modeling in general and, and, and uh, different disciplines a little bit. And then I'll go into the specific example of, of, uh, of the economic analysis of criminal law. Uh, and I as, I, as I said, early in my career, I spent a fair amount of time uh, uh, working on this, trying to figure this out, uh, figuring out how I fit into kind of an interdisciplinary uh, discourse on law. I did that in, in part politically because at the time, uh, law and economics was controversial. It's still somewhat controversial. Uh, uh, and if you could fit into a, kind of, if you could respect other disciplines and what they did, you could uh, you could still present what you wanted to, and and people would hire you. <laughs> so you, if you were too too uh, too snobby about your your particular discipline, then uh, you tend to upset people, and and uh, it's it's harder to get hired. It's harder to get your work accepted. So I I consciously worked on trying to integrate my work into this larger kind of framework of of analysis that I'll talk about at least briefly today. Let me share my PowerPoint. Let's see. Um, did that go up? Hmm. Yes. Is it is it up? Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, 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 let's see if I can. Well, I'm going to leave it like this because that, that way I can point to things. Uh, I know I'm I'm not the most adept at, at doing this all on Zoom, but but uh, w just work with me here. Uh, basically, um, uh, to talk about social science modeling in general here. And here I, I give you a, a little citation. I can send this uh, to Simon and he can send this, this PowerPoint out to people. Uh, this is a, a early essay I wrote in the Wisconsin Law Review comparing economics and sociology and kind of how the two work together. And I think it not only is it, I think, I think it's a good summary of kind of economic analysis and sociological analysis, but it also gives you kind of a general framework for how 
these disciplines fit in together and and uh, and how to make sense of a multidisciplinary analysis. And and basically, uh, in that in that essay, I argue that you know there's a variety of disciplines, and historically, they were not they were not. Uh, very different from each other. If you look back, you know, in the early 1800s, things like that. Uh, for example, Karl Marx, uh, he could be called a political scientist, he could be called a historian, he could be called an economist. People, uh, uh, you know, people who liked him claimed them for the discipline. People who didn't like him said he was some other discipline or something like that. He's not the only example of that. A lot of work at the time was very similar to each other. However, there was this divergence of the disciplines over time. And now there's kind of a reconvergence. And the divergence was over two things, subject matter and methodology, OK? And so for example, economics, uh, um, as most people think of it, uh, kind of acquired the, the subject matter of markets, uh, commercial markets and things like that. And for a long time, didn't talk thing, didn't talk about uh, things like uh, individual personal choices about marriage or models of discrimination, things like that. They focused just on the economics of markets, all right? Uh, whereas sociology went into things, social relationships, uh, um, anthropology went into, you know, human structures and things like that. Political science went into, into, into uh, government functioning, things like that. So they there was, I, it's not, I, I don't want to make too much of this argument, but there was a divergence of subject matter and then methodology. And I will talk about the methodology of economics the most because I know it the best. Uh, but I, I think that I can tell you a little bit about at least sociology and how its methodology differs and how they're related. And the two, within this, these, these multiple disciplines, there's basically two primary schools of modeling. There's deductive, there's deductive modeling, where, uh, which is what economics is, and you derive testable hypotheses, you deduce them from assumptions, uh, and then you test those hypotheses empirically. And I'll give you that in a longer list in just a minute. Versus inductive modeling. And sociology, traditional sociology, um, was inductive modeling. What they would do is they would look at the, at the data and then try to come up with theories to explain why the data ha happened in certain ways, all right? And I, I think that the two, they're not completely overlapped, but they are related in that one goes from the theory to the data and confirms it with the data. The other goes from the data to the theory, all right? So they're in some ways they're inverse processes. Now, as I said, uh, there was a divergence of methodology. Now you do see some convergence of methodology. In other words, in sociology, this, this inductive modeling is traditional sociology and political science. Whereas now you see some sociologists and some, and some political scientists using what is known as quote unquote, rational choice sociology. And they've adopted in some ways, um, the economics methodology for modeling and then testing. All right, so making assumptions and then testing against the data, all right? Um, let me show you this just in a little bit more detail. The method of economic analysis, and I've got this directly from a Posner. This is, this is actually, a Posner didn't think this up, but, but I've got a good source if you need a citation for it. Um, the methodology of, of economics is you make simplifying assumptions, you apply optimization theory, which is usually calculus or cost-benefit analysis. So in other words, we're gonna, we're gonna assume that there's perfect information. We're gonna assume that there's zero transaction costs. We're gonna assume that people rationally maximize their utility and firms rationally maximize their profits. And then what are the implications of that? You derive testable hypotheses. What are the implications of that? And then the step that often gets forgotten because it's costly and risky to do, but, but uh, you need to test those hypotheses empirically. So in other words, you, you come up with this model, you, you derive testable hypotheses based on your model, and then you test your model against the real world to see how useful your model is. Because if you make the wrong assumptions back here, if you make simplifying assumptions that do away with some, some essential part of the problem, you will get a bad model that yields bad hypotheses that don't match the data, all right? So this is where all the logic is done. And this is where we test the logic 
against reality to see how useful the model is, okay? And the art, now, um, a lot, of, sometimes people criticize economics as being reductivist, that it's, that, it, that it's too simple, it assumes away all the real problems of the world, and it, it can be, I mean, if you, if you make unrealistic assumptions. But I would argue that any sort of analysis has to make simplifying assumptions. I mean, even if you're a sociologist and you're moving from the empirical, if you're moving uh, inductively from the empirical to a theory, you are gonna assume as way certain things that could possibly be causing the data to end up the way it is. So you are, you are implicitly making simplifying assumptions when you come up with your, with your theory about why the data is the way it is. And I would argue that basically any kind of description or analysis inherently has to make simplifying assumptions. If you if you describe the real world and all its it, and all its its complications, you would be sitting there forever talking about things that were irrelevant. You would be talking about what people had for breakfast that morning. We would be talking about what the weather was. I mean, all of that stuff is probably irrelevant to what your model is. And the real art of economic analysis, or I would argue any kind of analysis, is to know which simplifying assumptions you can make to make the problem tractable so that you can understand it, but still retain the essential features of the phenomena, all right? In other words, we, we have to simplify it to understand. But if you make the wrong simplifying assumptions and do away with something that's important to the problem, you're gonna end up with a model that gives bad predictions and doesn't fit the data well, all right? So the real trick is to know which simplifying assumptions you can make in order to make it the phenomenon simple enough that you can model it and understand it, but still retain the, the essential features of the phenomenon so that your model is useful in predicting real data, all right? Are the question, that's a big, that's a big, that's, that's the, uh, you know, the, the million dollar uh, card right there for the, at least the, this initial kind of general introduction. Are there, are there questions about that or comments first before, before I go on and give you an example? Please just speak up because I may not be able to see uh, your hands and things. Yeah, J just a simple question, uh, Professor Schmidt, before going on. Uh, how would you differentiate, um, just that's, that's for the terminology, how would you differentiate a method from a methodology in this sense? From what? A method from methodology. Oh well, um, uh, I'm not sure I would differentiate. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm too simple. But 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 uh, um, uh, 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 you know. I just ask ask the question because in, in when you read many articles for different writers, they you, you cannot assume they're using the two words interchangeably or they mean different things. So that's why I asked. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so, uh, all right, L let me make sure I understand mm -hmm. which, the, the, so, so a theory from, from, a, from a, what's the second word? It's uh, uh, method from methodology. Method from methodology. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah that's, that, that goes beyond my simple econo economics mind. I, I don't, I'm not familiar with why they would differentiate those. They may have a good reason for it. But that goes beyond kind of my simple my simple understanding of this. All right, are there other other questions? Ferris, you should send me send me an example where they use them differently, and I'll try to figure that out. That that would be good. That would that that's I can always learn something from these presentations. Other other questions or comments? Now, so so early in my career, I'm figuring this all out, and I'm also looking. Where can I make a big splash in the legal literature so that I can get attention and get a job, you know, or, or a better job? Actually, at the time I was at the University of Cincinnati, it was a good place to be. I liked, I liked being there. I could have spent my whole career there, but I kind of wanted to work at a Big Ten university because I grew up in the Midwest and the Big Ten is, it's the, it's the, the big show in town. Uh, so I like, I like, I, and, uh, you know, I went to Big Ten universities. That's what I wanted. Um, so I, I looked around at kind of the general theory, economic theory of law, and I said, where does the current model fit the worst? And what, where it fit the worst, I thought, was criminal law. 
okay? And the current model, economic model of criminal law at the time was based on the neoclassical model, okay? And what we mean in economics by the neoclassical model, recall that I told you we, we make assumptions, we make simplified assumptions, apply optimization theory, derive testable hypotheses. Well, the neoclassical model is a certain set of simplifying assumptions. And those simplifying assumptions, here are some, the guys that came up with this, the neoclassical model, Marshall, Edgeworth, Begu, Pareto, Irving Fisher. Most of these guys are English or else French, although uh, uh, Vilfredo Pareto, that must be Italian. I'm not absolutely sure. And Fisher is, is an American. Uh, Pigou, I believe was French, but he worked in, in, in England. Um, but but what, what the neoclassical model is a certain set of assumptions zero transaction costs, perfect information, rational maximization, competitive markets, exogenous preferences. And what, what we mean by that is that the preferences, people's utility and preferences are determined outside of the system. They're just kind of either born with them or they derive them from their parents and then they go out to the world and their preferences are set and not affected by the market. And then declining marginal utility and declining marginal productivity. You could, there are some other assumptions that are sometimes added to this, but it's basically just this set of assumptions. So in other words, we plug in, we plug in those assumptions here. And the reason why they adopted these assumptions as a set was because they were useful. Well, they, they yield fairly simple, mathematically tractable models. And they were useful for a wide variety of economic phenomena. A lot of simple markets could be explained well by making these assumptions. All right. Uh, and as a result, the neoclassical model caught on. Now, um, the neoclassical model is, we, we know that these assumptions are not always literally true. Uh, zero transaction costs. Actually, uh, Coase once said that if, if zero transaction cost is, every, is, absolute, is actually true, everything happens in an instant and, you know, the world is over. I mean, that, that time taking time to do things is, in itself is a transaction cost. The, the legal profession is a transaction cost. I mean, our whole profession, profession exists because, because this, this assumption is not literally true. Perfect information is a very strong assumption. Uh, consumers and producers don't always have perfect information. They don't know what all the other options are. They don't know, um, you know, how to make something. Uh, other producers don't know how to enter a market because they've never done it before or whatever. Uh, they, they've made other things. Rational maximization. Uh, um, it, certainly people aren't rational about all decisions. Uh, you know, we have heat of passion in the law. Uh, uh, pe people who commit murders in the heat of passion, we're, we say, are not acting rationally. You can, you can object to the assumption of rationality well short of that, as I'll talk about in a minute. Behavioral economics has relaxed that assumption. Competitive markets, we know markets aren't always competitive. And in fact, a lot of economic work is done in antitrust law, looking at what are the implications of, of uh, non-competitive markets. And exogenous preferences. This is something. This is something that I relaxed in my analysis. But um, you can often see producers trying to influence uh, um, consumers not just through information, uh, price, quality information that is relevant to buying a good location, things like that, but trying to influence people's preferences. Uh, and and I think arguably the law sometimes tries to influence people's preferences. So so. The neoclassical model may be useful for some circumstances, but you may have other uh, phenomena where you want to relax these assumptions and come up with a different model that's more useful for the real world. All right. Now, uh, there are alternative economic models, and these aren't something I'm making up. This is, you know, there's whole schools in economics that do this. Transaction cost economics where they relax the zero transaction cost assumption, all right? And there's a whole school of thought, there's empirical work that's been done. What if, what if, see, this model is useful when transaction costs aren't important. What if we have phenomenon where transaction costs are, are important and they help us drive the decision? Well, then you wanna use transaction, you, you wanna relax the assumption of perfect, of, of zero transaction costs and you derive a transaction cost model. 
Same thing with perfect information. You could, we have models of asymmetric information. What if one side knows more about a deal than the other? And so we have models of imperfect information in economics. Uh, relaxing the assumption of rational maximization. Uh, we have a whole school of behavioral economics now where they assume that people aren't always entirely r rational. They use rule of thumbs. They are subject to framing. Uh, they have endowment effects, things like that. It's they aren't always they aren't necessarily acting rational, but they're still acting predictably. So that if we make a different assumption, they aren't they aren't purely rational. They have a framing effect or something like that. We can still put this in our model of make assumptions. There's a framing effect. Apply optimization theory. Derive conclusions. The framing effect is going to affect decisions in this way, and then we look at the results, the empirical, and and uh, and say, oh, this is useful for this phenomenon because there is a framing effect. Competitive markets, we, first of all, we could just have markets that are, we could look at what happens when you have monopoly or when you have monopsony. Uh, but we also have game theory. Uh, a lot of problems in the law don't look out in the general marketplace. They look at bilateral relationships between plaintiffs and defendants or between a contractor and a contractee. And those bi bilateral relationships can sometimes be more usefully modeled in game theory rather than in some theory that assumes that people efficiently bargain like they were in like they were in a in a marketplace and had options where they could go someplace else. And then the last one, uh, relaxing the assumption of exogenous preferences, I would argue you'll see uh, that um, I, I developed a preference shaping theory of the criminal law and argued that um, the criminal law is intended to affect preferences. And if you don't take account of that, you don't have an adequate explanation of all of the legal doctrine. All right. The questions about that before I go on to the example with uh, with uh, criminal law. All right. Now there is a neoclassical analysis of criminal law put together by Gary Becker, and it was very successful. He got he's not getting the Nobel Prize here. Oh, what did I do here? Uh, he's not getting the Nobel Prize here. He he must be getting some some uh, um, U.S. award because he's getting it from President George W. Bush. But he did win the Nobel Prize for three different works that he did. Uh, uh, his work in anti-discrimination uh, economics, his work in economics of the family, and his work in economics of criminal law. So this is part of the basis on which he got the, uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, he models crime as an externality. Criminals impose costs on other people because they they have criminal preferences and they and they try to take things or they commit rape or they commit murder or whatever. Uh, and we need to uh, you can have an efficient level of crime. We need to we need to force them to internalize those costs of crime in order to get them to make efficient decisions. All right, uh, and that's the traditional kind of Pigouvian solution to externalities in economics. We want the expected criminal penalties to equal to the harm to society from the criminal activity. And the harm includes the harm to the victims, the cost to the victims, the cost of precautions, and the cost of catching and punishing these people, all right? And if we have the expected criminal penalties, probability of catching them and punishing them times whatever the value of the punishment is, equal to this, Criminals will only engage in an efficient level of crime. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a, in law school and they came up with this, wow, an efficient level of crime, my ears kind of perked up and thought, I'm not sure that really occurs, all right? Now they give examples. The examples they give are uh, double parking to, to pick up medicine at, at, at a uh, pharmacist for your you know, sick child. And it's true that it's illegal to double park and you inconvenience other people and put costs on them, but you can see how sometimes maybe the benefits from that double parking might outweigh the costs. Or the other example they give is what I call the Goldilocks parable, where somebody who's wandering through the woods and needs to break into a cabin to steal food to survive uh, is excused by the necessity defense, all right? And those are argued, it's argued that those are, those are, uh, economically efficient crimes. Now, uh, 
I would argue there's other explanations there that those that 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 the first crime is not a crime that's malum and say it's it's merely malum prohibitum. It's basically just a public tort. Malum and say rape and murder. It's very hard to come up with this idea of an efficient crime. Uh, it's very hard to justify it based on that. Uh, the, the second one, the necessity defense, as you'll see, I would argue, you know, if you break into a cabin, don't hurt anybody, but take food to survive. We don't know anything about your preferences when that happens. Anybody would do that to survive. So therefore, it's not a criminal act. And I, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But if you take this neoclassical model, you get certain implications. A, there is an efficient level of crime, and I already went through those examples. B, there is an optimal form of punishment, fines. So in other words, Becker's argument is why ever use criminal confinement? It's too costly. The only time you should use criminal confinement is if the defendant can't afford to pay a commensurate fine. Uh, uh, and then you would have to impose that cost. And then also the, uh, there's an argument about the optimal level of enforcement that you would leave that optimally to save money, you to save policing costs, you would have penalties very high, but have enforcement low because the expected penalty can be uh, P times F can be arrived at the same way with either a very high probability of catching criminals and a low fine, or else a very low probability of catching criminals and a high fine, all right? Now, I think this model leaves some important puzzles. And this is where, okay, so now they uh, made assumptions of the neoclassical model. They, uh, they applied optimization theory. They came up with certain conclusions. That's what Becker did. He applied the economic analysis the way he's supposed to. Uh, he just used the neoclassical model. I think it doesn't, fit. now the question is, is how well does it fit the data? And the data in this case is criminal doctrine, criminal legal doctrine. And I think there's some important ways in which this model does not fit the data well. One of them is the importance of mens rea. You may recall from your, your you know, first year criminal law courses, mens rea and actus rea are the core necessities to prove a crime. You always need mens rea. Uh, um, why require that for a crime? If, if if criminal law is merely to deter, to bring a, an efficient level of deterrence, to deter criminal activity to a low level, to deter harm on other people, why do we care whether that harm is intentionally caused or unintentionally caused? All right. Uh, and and therefore, why do we why do we distinguish the criminal law from tort law? Because tort law we use for deterrence. Now, another puzzle is why punish attempts where there's no actual harm. And the hypothetical I usually give my law and economics seminar is the one I remember from my first year criminal law class is somebody takes a broken gun and goes to a sleeping person, puts it to their head and pulls the trigger intending to kill them. But they don't know that it won't work because the gun is broken. Uh, the sleeping person doesn't wake up. There's no harm. Nevertheless, that is attempted murder. That's a very serious act. If you actually have mens rea and do the actus rea of actually pulling the trigger, the fact that the gun, you don't know that the gun doesn't function, won't save you. The fact that you did no harm won't save you. You have demonstrated criminal preferences and we would punish you for that. And then the final thing that I think they have trouble explaining is the necessity of defense. In other words, um, uh, uh, that goes back to the Goldilocks parable. They would they would say, well, we don't we don't punish somebody who breaks into a cabin uh, to steal food to survive because um, uh, um, it's an efficient crime. But if if all you're doing is deterrence, you should impose the penalty because we want to we want to keep breaking into cabins at an efficient level. Whereas under the necessity of defense, we say. Uh, there's no criminal act here, so therefore nothing to punish. We don't punish you at all. If 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 their argument of deterrence was an adequate explanation, it would be like tort law. It's it's true that you know you you did this out of necessity, but you still have to pay the tort damages. All right. Now, 
So when I'm I'm in back early in my career and I'm looking at this and I'm saying, uh, what's wrong with this? Well, my argument is they have picked the wrong assumptions. All right, back here, making simplifying assumptions. It's not that deterrence has nothing to do with criminal law. Deterrence is clearly part of the criminal law. So this is, it's not that Becker is entirely wrong, but his simplifying assumptions leave out something that's important to the criminal law, all right? He has made a simplifying assumption that assumes away something that is fundamental. And my argument is, what I argued is, this is where they went wrong. In other words, uh, assuming exogenous preferences. The tort law may assume exogenous preferences and deterrence may only be important in tort law. But at least for crimes that are malum and say, we are actually punishing certain preferences. We don't treat criminal behavior the same as the behavior that it, that it, that it imposes on. We don't treat rapists as morally equal to the people that they rape, just, just imposing some kind of cost that has to be balanced. We treat, the, we treat that activity as morally inferior because it is an insidious preference where somebody can be made happy only at the unhappiness of somebody else, all right? And so my argument is the criminal law, we have tort law to deter uh, behavior. The criminal law is intended to identify deviant preferences and punish them for the purposes of shaping preferences, either for that particular individual or by teaching other people that these preferences aren't to be desired. And you can see that in the trade-off between whether somebody engages in crime, here's criminal activity and here's honest activity, and this is the person's trade-off. You can either discourage crime. So in this case, this person is deciding to engage in C1 amount of crime here. You can discourage that either by increasing the cost, the, the penalties for crime, and therefore decreasing the payoff for it, or by shaping the person's preferences so that they don't, they don't want to engage in crime, all right? And uh, my argument is that the criminal law, so, so tort law is intended to shape opportunities. Criminal law identifies deviant preferences and punishes them for the purposes of sh indicating to that individual and society as a whole that those preferences aren't to be engaged in. It's like when your parents, instruct you when you're young. <laughs> uh, only what happens is if the family fails here, then society takes over. If the family fails so much that you you engage in crimes when you're an adult, society punishes you. All right, now, so what I would argue then is, um, uh, if we go back to these puzzles, why is mens rea important? The reason why mens rea is important is if you don't have deviant preferences, if you don't desire to bring about the harm, it's not a case for criminal punishment, all right? Whereas if you do have mens rea, if you put the, the uh, broken gun to somebody, the sleeping person's head, we know you want to kill them. Now you do have deviant preferences and it is a, a instance where you should be punished, all right? Same thing here, that explains why do we punish attempts when there's no actual harm? It's because the attempt itself, you have the actus rea and the mens rea, it's a criminal act. And then as to why we have the necessity defense, my argument is if somebody breaks into a cabin to steal food to survive, a, a very honest person would do that. We don't know anything about your preferences at that point. We still, we might make you pay toward damages, which we would, uh, for the break-in, but it's not a criminal act because, you know, even a nun would break into a cabin to steal food to survive. I mean, it, it, so as a result, there's no crime. That's why, it's, that's why necessity is a complete defense to criminal punishment, all right? So that's, a, that's an example of, I think, of, okay, so back here, and you don't have to agree with me on my model, believe me, not everybody does, um, but I think this is an example of how Becker made one choice of simplifying assumptions, got one set of hypotheses, and you can compare them with the data and the criminal doctrine. And it's not that he doesn't explain anything. Believe me, deterrence is part of the criminal law. So his model explains some of the criminal law. But I would argue his simplifying assumptions were too simple. 
it's not only deterrence, but it's also education and preference shaping are a purpose of the criminal law. And if you add that to the model, you get a more complex model, but you get different, different conclusions. And when we look at the empirics, I would argue my model fits the legal doctrine better, which in this case, those are the empirics we're talking about. So that's an example of how you use different assumptions in in modeling to get different, different a different model, which hopefully is, and then you can argue about whether it's better or worse based on the empirics. All right. Now, empirical work here. I got my empirical work. My empirical test here is the legal doctrine. Of course, the legal empirical work usually is empirical work is is uh, you know how many contracts get breached or or. Uh, um, I don't know what you know what the what the demand is for this or whether people use this or things. I mean, there are there are many other empirical measures where in the real world that you might use against this. But at least for legal scholars, legal doctrine in itself can be an empirical observation that we're trying to explain. All right. All right. Are there questions or comments about that, uh, Professor? I would like to know your opinion whether in any situation. Every we can simplify every assumption. Well, um, so are you asking basically? Are there are there phenomena that are too complex to usefully model? Or, uh, I mean, uh, whether we can consider the uh, whether in any situation every com complex factor can be simplified to make this analysis. Or are there like specific like prohibitions of simplifying certain things? See, I think that's the art here. So like in law, the neoclassical model, I think can work pretty well with some legal problems. So the example I always give my law and economics seminar is who bears the risk of loss on shipping cars, a big railway or GM? All right, and I think if you look for the efficient result, what, what the parties would have agreed to, it's pretty easy to argue that the default clause should be the shipper bears the risk of loss because they have control over the situation. And in that, making that conclusion as to what's the efficient result, I'm making some implicit assumptions. I am assuming um, zero transaction cost, perfect information. Uh, this model right here yields that efficient results. And you see there, it's, not, it's certainly not true that there are absolutely zero transaction costs, but in a contract between GM and a major railway as to who bears the risk of loss, the transaction costs are probably pretty small compared to all the cars that they ship, all right? And it's a big corporation versus another corporation. You can probably assume that they're acting pretty rationally and they're acting about, they're, they're dealing about a subject that nobody has any emotion about, right? Who bears the risk of loss? It's just it's just dollars and cents to them. So so the assumption that they're acting rationally is probably a pretty good assumption. Now, if you looked at the problem of who gets custody of a child in a divorce, now you're you're in a completely different problem. And if you assumed that transaction costs aren't important, that's probably a bad assumption. If you assume that people are coldly rational about who gets custody of a child, that's probably a bad assumption. All right. So in other words, a simple neoclassical model of the law can probably explain risk of loss in big corporation contracts pretty well, even though it's not literally true. But it probably does not explain things like custody fights or um, certainly, you know, murders in the heat of passion and things like that. All right. Does that make sense? And see the, the art, as I said, is knowing how much you can relax and make it understandable, but still have a useful model with, 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 uh, the, with the problem of who bears the risk of loss, you can make all of these simplifying assumptions, get a nice simple model, and it's still useful. Uh, if you did that with custody battles, you could you could make all these simplifying assumptions, you would still get conclusions, but I would I would bet dollars to donuts. That, they, that the model would not be useful. It would not explain very much, okay? Other questions or comments?
And economists themselves realize this. I mean, you know, everybody hears about the neoclassical model, but actually all of these, these, these schools of thought in economics are all major cutting edge schools of thought now. So economists realize this, that, that for certain phenomenon, the simple model works well. For other phenomenon, you have to look at more complex models. All right. And, and I, would, I would say that's true for sociology too. I mean, I, maybe I have too simple a model of other disciplines, but for certain phenomenon, sociologists could have a pretty simple model. For other phenomenon, uh, they'd say, John, there's so many moving parts here. The only way to explain this is to have a complex explanation of this happens when this is true and something else happens when this other thing is true. And you, get, you would get a much, much, much more complex sociological model, I, I would think. Right. All right. Other questions or comments? <clears throat> what a wild enterprise you guys are engaged in, huh? Uh, um, are you all aspiring academics or? No, trying to be. <laughs> trying to be. Trying to be. <laughs> All right, my only advice, work hard, try to be creative, uh, pay attention. I'll tell you, I learned so much just by paying attention, even when it wasn't, when it wasn't aimed at me, you know, other people's presentations, what they thought was important, how they did things. Um, yeah, you, you learn a lot over, over the years. I do have a, a, a kind of a, a question based on the Taiwanese criminal legal system here. And I would be intrigued to learn about how you would apply this model into that phenomenon. So uh, we do have a phenomenon that people advocate for imposing more uh, criminal uh, criminal sentencing for people who drunk drive. Um, so based on uh, this, uh, based on your model, how would you uh, analyze uh, this kind of policy policy issue? Okay. So the, so the question is 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 so so they've increased penalties for drunk driving. Yeah, and there, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there, there is a yeah, they increase penalty for drunk driving. Exactly. Okay, so I I would say and and drunkenness is a problem because it, it can be addictive, but but so that can have a problem fitting into rational choice. But but at the very least, I would say uh, it's you could look at it as deterrence. They're just increasing the price, but they also are they putting people in jail for this? Um, heavy fine. Um, Yes, and jail, yeah. And jail. Yeah. See, I would argue if you're putting people in jail, you are saying this is a morally bad thing to engage in. And, and uh, uh, people should learn not to do this and you should learn from their example not to do this. If they're just charging fines, you can have, you can have crimes that are just malum, malum prohibitum, like double parking. And that, that doesn't fit my model well because it's basic, basically just a public tort. But if they are putting people in jail, they are saying this is such a serious imposition of cost on other people that for you to be reckless enough to get drunk and then drive is actually malum and say, and we are gonna teach you that that's a bad preference. And we'll teach other people that that's a bad preference is what, is what I would say about that. And we do that in this country too. We, we, uh, I couldn't tell you exactly how fast it escalates but if you if you drunk drive and kill somebody, that's that's manslaughter, uh, uh, and they would they could go to jail for a potentially a long period of time. Um, all right, how are we doing on time? We're doing well. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I can show you guys pictures of my. Uh, I always put a little thank you up here. This is, this is, you should go over and look at the art in the, uh, the art museum, but also this is actually in the, uh, in the uh, theater. Uh, and it's an American Impressionist, Anna Schultz, and it's over in our, our, uh, our auditorium. But these are, here are, here's the grandson. He's a little older now that I was visiting in Italy. And these are two other grandchildren that I have up in Wisconsin. Um, so they are, that's your thank you for paying attention. <laughs> They're adorable. <laughs> <laughs> They're fun. Uh, They're fun. Thank you, Professor right. Schmidt. Uh, was a uh, informative and good presentation. I actually have have one lift question. Sure, go ahead. 
Yeah. So it's about the internalization of the coast uh, and following up on the on the example uh, you, you discussed with Simon uh, about putting people in jail. So putting people in jail would impose costs on the state and on the, the taxpayer. Yeah. Uh, so does that also could be considered like an internalization of the coast, even if we still, as a society, are paying for that price? Uh, internalization, even though we... Yeah, no, that's, well, it certainly raises the cost of crime to society. That's true. Now, let me give you an example. I'll give you an example why I don't think uh, uh, you can just look at it at a deterrence theory. The example is, and this is a real life example, uh, Mike Tyson, uh, I, 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 he's probably famous enough that even though you guys aren't Americans or most, uh, all of you aren't Americans, you, you probably heard of Mike Tyson. He was a fabulous fighter back in, I don't know what, the 90s, I'll have to say. He got in some trouble because he raped a woman in Indianapolis. And it had been alleged that he had raped women before, but he had always gotten away with it because he had paid them off. And But he was convicted in Indianapolis of this rape. So we, he, he is a criminal now, and he's been convicted of rape. And no less a personality than Donald Trump at the time. So they're considering what how to sentence him. And at the time, uh, Mike Tyson made $40 million a fight. And his fights took about a minute and 30 seconds. I mean, he knocked out people so quickly. It, you know, so he can make $40 million in a minute and 30 seconds. Uh, um, but okay, so now the question is, is how to sentence Mike Tyson? And Donald Trump actually suggested at the time, this is a fabulously productive person. Don't put him in jail. If you put him in jail, he can't do fights for $40 million. Figure out what the victim should get, and it could be it could be it could be forty million dollars, uh, whatever she should get as compensation, and then add on, make them pay another forty million dollars, uh, and you could give the money to rape crisis centers. Uh, so give them an eighty million dollar fine, but don't put them in jail because it's too wasteful to put them in jail. And the judge looked at that, and and you know it's true. He could have he could have done two fights, and he could have paid a forty million dollar fine to the to the uh, victim, and a forty million dollar fine to society, and he could have run around. But the but the judge looks at that and says, and of course the judge didn't do it, because the problem with that is, we don't want him trading off. Oh, it's eighty million dollars to commit a rape. We believe rape is actually morally bad. He should not have preferences. And, so, and people in general should not have preferences to rape. It's not like double parking. It's not like an accident. It is a malicious, uh, 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 intentional act that derives pleasure only from somebody else's pain. And as a result, even though he could have paid a, an incredible fine, they put him in jail. And I can't remember for how long, but it was a significant period of time. Uh, and I, I think that that, suggests that that tells me Becker's model does not explain the criminal law completely. Deterrence is an important part. I mean, you can always say, oh, this is too serious of an event. It's got to have a high fine or something like that. But there are certain events that are so serious, no fine. Oh. I'm sorry, Professor, you're muted. To show you how technologically inept I am. Well, actually, it's not my fault. I guess the the uh, I plugged my laptop into an outlet in my office, which apparently does not have electricity. So so my my so now it's plugged into another outlet, and I'm back. But I'm I'm sorry for that. Uh, this is there are some problems with this Zoom, uh, aren't there? Uh, I guess I should have known that that outlet wasn't working, but I didn't know that. We're very glad that you're back. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> panics you to lose your whole audience at, at a time but um any other questions or comments i have a question professor Schmidt. sure go ahead um i think um, uh, what we are talking about is um, a kind of like distinct distinction between what is public and what's private and making or uh, making uh, the criminal law uh, under the category of public law, which means it belongs to the state, the whole society, the whole, the whole community. Um, it's not a tort, it's not a contract. Um, if I'm speaking about my position as the one who um, uh, like interested in the field of Islamic law, 
And Islamic law uh, was formed before uh, the modern area, before the existence of the nation state inside the Muslim world. And at this time, um, like uh, crimes against uh, body or um, against life, uh, were categorized under the, um, uh, the category of private law. It's something which is between the offender and the victim. Uh, and community has no thing to do with, with this matter. But after the existence of uh, or um, the creation of the nation state in, in our communities, in the Muslim world communities, uh, uh, people started to, uh, to have a gap because until now we don't have a kind of like of harmonization between uh, Islamic law and the new nation state. Um, so until now we have uh, like uh, the, the, the scholars of Islamic law, of Islamic law um, like are speaking about um, uh, uh, crimes against uh, uh, people or uh, against life or against the body as it uh, as if uh, like it is a kind of like a private uh, matter or a tort matter. I, I'm not I'm not uh, uh, sure if if, if that is related to what we are talking about the context of uh, of the ideas itself so if i'm if i'm speaking about the islamic law so the context speaks about those crimes are, are um, uh, we don't care about uh, we are as a, as a community or as a state we don't care about this the issue it's something which is between which is between offender and victim but if we are talking about uh, or from a context or from a perspective of a state the new nation state uh, we we can't say that um, i'm not sure if i'm right or wrong uh, in, in I think you're way. right, and I, and I think that's a, 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 a good, a useful distinction. We don't talk very much about the distinctions between private and public law in the states, but I know in other countries they do a lot, and, and I think you laid it out well that, that for, so for example, if it was a simple tort, if a guy ran into my mailbox and the question is, is what does he compensate me? I certainly can settle that, and the state has no interest in that. And that, and we use that just as deterrence, right? I mean, that is governed by deterrence, simple deterrence. But you're absolutely right. With Mike Tyson, uh, one of the objections to only paying, having him only pay a fine or settling. Actually, the objection is with him settling with the women that he settled with before. The the, the state says we have an interest in there. We don't want even if even if he can pay women he's raped to be quiet, we have an interest in not having rapists out there. And we have a, an interest in people learning that rape is, is not to be engaged in. And, and uh, so that would be another objection to the argument that, that oh, just, just make them pay a fine. Why put somebody who's so productive in jail? Uh, so I think you're absolutely right. Now, it is true that if victims don't object, it becomes very hard to prosecute a crime sometimes, so that so it it does sometimes turn on uh, whether the criminal whether the victim wants to go forward with prosecution or not. Uh, but but uh, you could, I mean, a, a, a theoretically, if you had the evidence, uh, and sometimes they do have the evidence. It's not only theoretical, but if if the state has the evidence, even if the victim says, "I don't want to go forward with this," the state the state can prosecute the person. They have an interest in prosecuting the person, independent of what the victim says. So no, I think that's I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, uh, can, can I add another thing? Like, if we sure. are speaking, uh, if we are speaking about uh, international criminal law, I think um, like um, uh, the idea of uh, making the victim being engaged in in the court, in the international court. And uh, I, I have read. I'm not sure if it's right or wrong, but I have read to um, uh, to some scholars in this field who were just like saying, "Let the victim say what um, what they want. Uh, what what because like we don't want. How can we uh, like compensate them for uh, the crimes which uh, were committed against them, the human rights or, or crimes against um, um, uh, their um, ethnicity or whatever? So we don't know. So let them go to the court and say. Uh, this are this, those are my rights, and we need one, two, three, and we can't engage in uh, in in like in um, in the process of uh, um, uh, penalizing the offenders in this issue. Um, uh, is this related to uh, what what we are talking about or not? I, I, like, I think I think so. Yes, like yes. the privatization of 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 the victims' uh, right or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Schmidt. I know that you have a meeting in, in like yeah. three minutes. Uh, we really appreciate that, uh, uh, having you. And just like a suggestion, following up on Jabber comments, that's maybe that's another another uh, another topic that's informal justice and uh, and economic analysis. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, we we should get together in person sometime. Yep.
Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you.